words. I believe that your prayer uh, has already been answered from what I was able to look at this morning. Your influence has already bypassed mine, and I can truthfully say, uh, in all sincerity, I would much rather have your future than my past. So, brother, you're, you're doing a, a great job here, and thank you for taking time to pray for me and for our church this evening. I am uh, very blessed and edified to uh, have experienced that. So how many of you are familiar with a child's game that they play in a swimming pool called Marco Polo? Marco Polo. I was not familiar with this game as a child. We did not have a pool. But I understand the game. It's pretty simple. There will be one child that will have their eyes closed and they will say Marco, and then there will be some other children in the pool, and they will say Polo. And the object of the game is to go in the direction of those whom you hear saying Polo, and uh, to get them Marco Polo. Somebody speaks, somebody listens, one has their eyes closed, and they move in that direction. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for your word, and now that we have another opportunity on this beautiful afternoon to open your word and to study, I pray, Lord, that we will learn about encouragement, and Lord, I also pray that you, by your spirit, would equip us to become encouragers, uh, so that your church might grow, so that your people might be edified, uh, Lord, primarily so that you will be glorified in these evidences of grace in our lives. So, Lord, please... Uh, for your glory, make us encouragers. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In 2008, our oldest son, Parker, moved for his senior year from New York to Georgia to live with my wife's parents uh, for two reasons. Number one, he wanted to gain Georgia State residency so that he could go to the University of Georgia, which thankfully he did. Second reason why he wanted to do it is he wanted to play one season of football. He had never played football as a homeschooler growing up in New York City. He never had an opportunity to play football. And so he went to Georgia and he joined the football team at his local high school. When he got there, he realized it was a little bit tougher than he thought that it was going to be. And so he became discouraged and he called me, talking to me about how tough it was. And so as a good father... What I did for him is I purchased three used, inexpensive DVDs, and I mailed them all to him at the same time. And those three DVDs were Rocky, Rudy, and The Pursuit of Happiness. Rocky, Rudy, The Pursuit of Happiness. If you haven't seen any of these movies, you only need to watch one of them because they are all the same movie. It's a story of someone who is not getting any help or encouragement from the outside, and they are expected to look within, to pick themselves up by their own bootstraps, and to press on stories of people who overcome great adversity without any encouragement from the outside. Rocky, Rudy, The Pursuit of Happiness. Three really good movies, three really bad examples of how the church should be run. Because sadly, in the church in the 21st century, we treat one another often as though the other person is Rocky Balboa. Whereas the Bible says that what we are to be doing is we are to be encouraging one another and building one another up. Uh, I would ask, please, that you would turn in your copy of the Scripture to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Tonight we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11. And in this text of Scripture, God gives an imperative, that is a command, that we are to encourage one another and to build one another up. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul writes, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another... And build one another up or edify one another just as you are doing. 
several things I would like you to notice about this text. The first thing I want you to notice is that something very ironic is happening here, and that is that in the process of commanding them to encourage one another, Paul actually encourages them, and he does so with this little tag at the end of verse 11, which says, just as you are doing. You see how clever he is? He says, you are to be encouraging one another, and then he says, just as you are doing. You know what that is? That is encouragement. So he's giving them an example of what encouragement looks like. The other thing that I want you to notice is that the doctrine of encouragement is Trinitarian. It is Trinitarian. We read in Romans chapter 5, uh, 15, verse 5, that God, that is God the Father, is referred to as the God of endurance and encouragement. We also see that the third person of the Trinity is an encourager. Uh, the word there for encourage is the Greek word parakaleo, which, by the way, is the correct mispronunciation of that word. And it is uh, a derivative of or similar to the word that Jesus uses in the upper room discourse when he speaks about the Holy Spirit, the one who is to come, that is the paraclete or parakletos, uh, the encourager who is to come. So when we encourage one another, we not only look like our Heavenly Father, but we also look like the third person of the Trinity, that is the Holy Spirit. But the main thing that I want you to see in this text is that it is Trinitarian in that encouragement is based in, it is anchored in, and it is propelled by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, let's just work our way through the text. He says, for God has not destined us for wrath. Uh, that is really good news. Uh, there are some people who are destined for wrath, and they will be in hell. But Paul says, here's the good news. You are not one of those people. By contrast, you are destined to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity. And how is it that the Lord Jesus Christ has brought us salvation? Well, it says that in verse 10. Who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Who died for us. This is the gospel, and of course the gospel is of first importance. The way that we are saved is through the fact that the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, went to a cross and died in our place. And so we see that the, the, the gospel is that which informs the doctrine of encouragement. Uh, if you do not have the gospel in the doctrine of encouragement, well, really, all you have is just a pep talk or a halftime speech or a pat on the back or how to win friends and influence people or how to catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. It, it, it basically becomes either manipulation or flattery or a Tony Robbins seminar, but biblical encouragement has much more to it than that. And that is, we have attached to our doctrine of encouragement the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because, because of him, we are going to heaven, and these are the terms that Paul uses. And he uses two extremes here, whether we are asleep or awake, which is just a euphemistic way of saying whether we live or whether we die, or anything in between, we are going to be with the Lord. And then he uses the word, therefore. It doesn't say, encourage one another and build one another up, but it says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Well, that therefore is propelled by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins. And so what we have ultimately in this Trinitarian doctrine of encouragement and building one another up, what we have is objectively speaking, no reason whatsoever to ever be discouraged. You know that hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? And I would always sing those words, we should never be discouraged. And I always thought, you know, that's kind of hokey because sometimes we are discouraged and maybe there's good reason to be discouraged. But I think that the writer of that hymn got it correct objectively, we should never be discouraged. Now, there might be a lot of things which are going to happen between now and the end of our lives which 
are discouraging or which would get us down. But ultimately, whether we're awake or whether we're, we sleep, we are going to be with the Lord. I mean, look at what we have objectively. That we are joined to Christ. We have union with Christ. We have been redeemed. Our sins have been washed away. They're never going to be remembered anymore. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We have the Bible. We have the church. We have the surety of heaven as our home. We have God as our Father. We have Christ as our Savior. We are forgiven. There is no reason objectively to be discouraged. However, we do become discouraged. And the reason we become discouraged is because we live in a discouraging world. Turn on your television, and it doesn't matter what network you turn on, you're going to watch something which is spiritually discouraging. You're sitting in church this evening, and we are singing God's praises, you're fellowshipping with God's people, but tomorrow morning you're going to get in your car and you're going to go to work, and you're going to be sitting either in the cubicle next to or in some way associated with someone else. They're going to be taking God's name in vain. They're going to be speaking about women in a derogatory way. Their language is going to be vulgar. At best, they are going to be neutral, and probably the environment that you work in is going to be discouraging. Uh, the flesh can make you discouraged. Uh, Paul says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. So you are a liar and you tell lies all the time and the person that you lie to the most is yourself. And what you tell yourself primarily, it's not gospel truth, but it's lies. Not only will the media, not only will the workplace or the school or the team discourage us, but some of you are in discouraging families. You're here with your church family tonight, but you're going to go home into a house where people don't know the Lord. Circumstances can cause us to be discouraged, whether it is financial problems or sickness or depression, whatever it may be, Job put it this way, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble, therefore we all need encouragement, and so God in his kindness and in his wisdom, even though we never should be discouraged, says you people need to be talking to one another and as you are talking to one another, in light of the gospel, you need to be encouraging one another and building one another up. I think that's what the text means. It's pretty simple up to this point. I haven't given you anything that is profound or complex theologically. If you're listening, I think you understand. So the question needs to be asked. If it is needed, and if we are commanded to do it, then why don't we do it? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons. One of them is that it's pretty hard to encourage others if you have never been encouraged yourself. Some people just don't know how because they've never received any encouragement. Many years ago, I was preaching the text of Scripture where God the Father was speaking verbally from heaven, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And in order to illustrate that point, my son, Parker, who was about eight or nine years old, was sitting on the front row, and I had him come up on the stage. And I said to him, I said, Parker, I want you to know that I love you. But not only do I want you to know that I love you, I want them to know that I love you and I want you to know that I'm proud of you, and I'm glad you're my son. And then he sat down. It was a very simple illustration. I didn't think another thing of it. I preached the rest of the sermon. I went to the door. As I was shaking hands with people as they were leaving, there was a woman in her mid-80s who passed by, and this was a woman who normally was very unemotional. And she shakes my hand, and she said, Pastor, when you brought that boy up on stage and you told him in front of everyone that you loved him, that you were proud of him, I want you to know that my mother and my father both lived and died, and never did either one of them ever once ever tell me that they loved me. So I think it would be difficult for you to be an encourager if you have never been encouraged. Other people never encourage because it's just not part of their personality. They don't say much at all, much less encouragement. 
Other people do not encourage because they have seen abuses of it in the form of manipulation and flattery, and they don't want to do that. Other people don't encourage because they are fearful that they will give a big head to the person that they are encouraging. Other people don't encourage because they are in so much pain themselves that they don't even think about other people. I mean, in theory, it would be okay to encourage other people, but that would never cross their mind because they're only always thinking about themselves. They are in such pain. To you, I would say, remember what I spoke about this morning, the pain of our Lord Jesus Christ. Never has one been in as much pain as he was in, and yet for six hours on the cross, he used what few words he had in order to encourage others. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. His words were being used in order to encourage other people. So just because we are hurting doesn't mean that we have a license not to encourage other people. Other people don't encourage, and this is very nuanced, but they don't encourage because they are jealous. And so if I acknowledge something in you which is good or superior to me, well, then what I am doing is I am admitting that you are better than me and because I am jealous of you and I am envious of you, therefore I'm not going to say anything good about you or to you, but I'm just going to say something critical about you. There's a number of reasons why people don't encourage, but none of these are valid excuses, and the reason they are not valid excuses is because God clearly has commanded us to do so. When you talk to one another, encourage one another and build one another up. So, what does encouragement look like? Let me tell you a Bible story. This is a Bible story about a man by the name of Joseph, although you probably don't know him by the name of Joseph. You probably know him by the name of Barnabas. He first appears in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. He is a Levite who has moved from uh, Cyprus to Jerusalem. He has gotten saved, and obviously he has become wealthy because he had a piece of land. Sold that piece of land and gave the money to the church. Uh, this is a man that was so encouraging that the disciples or the apostles gave him a nickname or gave him a change of name and called him Barnabas, which by interpretation means son of encouragement. And how did he demonstrate encouragement in the early church? Well, first of all, I've already alluded to this, um, he had a piece of land, sold the land, gave all of the money to the church so that the practical needs of the widows and those that were poor in Jerusalem would be met. That was a big source of encouragement. Also, he was very encouraging in the life of Saul of Tarsus. You remember Saul of Tarsus? He was a Christian hater uh, and a Christian killer, and he hated the concept of Jesus Christ. And he was on his way to Damascus with letters in order to arrest, apprehend Christians, bring them back to Jerusalem so that they might be tried and executed. And you remember that as Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus, he was hit with a bright light. He was taken into Damascus. He was blind for three days. Ananias came and prayed for him. And then Paul, or Saul, we'll call him Paul from now on, Paul stayed in Damascus. He preached the gospel boldly. He had to escape by being put into a basket and let down by ropes. He escaped, and for three years, he disappears to Arabia. Not Saudi Arabia, but Arabia near Damascus. After those three years, he wants to reunite with the mother church, and so he comes back to Jerusalem. When he comes into Jerusalem, the disciples don't want to meet with him because they don't believe that he's really saved. And so what they do is they don't meet with him, and they would not have met with him if it was not for the doctrine of encouragement. It was Barnabas that went to the church and said, he is one of us, he has seen the Lord. Side note of a side note, this isn't the main point of the sermon, but just consider this. Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, the first time he tried to join a church was rejected. 
If you, in your membership interview, are temporarily turned down, you are in good company. Don't give up. Keep with it. Keep trying to join the church. Now, back to the message. He comes into Jerusalem. He's there for 15 days, and he preaches the gospel, and he gets the endorsement of the apostles. Here's another place where Barnabas was an encourager. Look over in your Bibles in Acts chapter 11, verse 23. Christians were scattering away from Jerusalem because of persecution. One of the places that they went was Antioch. As they are in Antioch, uh, the disciples want to know, is this a genuine, is this a real work of God? And so they send the son of encouragement, Barnabas, to look at the situation. It says, speaking of Barnabas, when he goes to Antioch, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. This is the quintessential definition of encouragement. You see the grace of God at work. You recognize an evidence of grace. And then you have a glad heart. It makes you happy. And then you say something to those in whom the grace of God is evident. This is what he did in Antioch. And then the final example of encouragement that we see in the life of Barnabas is that he and Paul were sent out as missionaries from Antioch. First place they went was down to the island of Cyprus. They went across the island preaching the gospel from the east to the west. And then they sailed north and they went into the Roman region of uh, Galatia. When they left, they took a young man with them by the name of Mark or John Mark. And out of nowhere, for an inexplicable reason, in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, it says uh, in the middle of this missionary journey that John Mark quits and he goes home. The story continues. Paul and Barnabas make their way up north. They plant churches. They circle back. They encourage those churches. They go over to Antioch. When they were there, they had to deal with a crisis. We know that crisis as the Jerusalem Council. And they go over to Jerusalem. While they're there, they settled the problem of whether or not Gentiles need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And then they make their way back over to Antioch. And they're in Antioch there for about a year and Paul says to Barnabas, you know what, let's go back and visit the churches we planted. And you know what Barnabas said? You know what, let's go back and visit the churches that we planted. Let me get John Mark and we will be on our way. And Paul said, uh-uh, no way, uh-uh, it ain't happening. He quit on us once, we can't afford to take him again. And the division between Paul and Barnabas was so great that Paul picked a new partner, that was Silas. They went north up to Cilicia and then down through Galatia. And Barnabas took a new partner, and that was John Mark. And they went back down to Cyprus. Now, I'm not here tonight to settle the debate as to who was in the right. Uh, if I had to decide, I would say probably uh, in those circumstances, Paul was right. Uh, I'll say that for two reasons. Number one, Luke follows the journey of Paul, and Paul and Silas were the ones who were commended to the grace of God. But be that as it may, here's one thing I do know. When Paul gets to the end of his life, and he is in a Roman prison, and he is writing the last chapter of the last book that he will write, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 11, he writes these words to young Timothy. Bring Mark, or John Mark, with you, for he is profitable, not just profitable, but he is profitable for me for ministry. My question is, how does this guy go from being a quitter to being one that Paul is asking for specifically by name at the end of his life? And the answer is the doctrine of encouragement. And you say, wow, these are really great stories. That really is wonderful. There's more to it than this, brothers and sisters. Please understand what is at play here. When you open your Bible and read the 13 books of the Apostle Paul, beginning with the book of Romans, do you understand there is no Apostle Paul apart from Barnabas? 
I hope that your ecclesiology is good enough to know that you don't just send yourself or you don't just appoint yourself to go. Paul needed the affirmation of the Jerusalem church and the apostles in order to become who he became, and he doesn't become that without Barnabas going to bat for him. And also consider that there are four accounts of the life of Christ. There's Matthew, there's Luke, there's John, and then there's another one. It's the book of Mark. Roughly one quarter of the information that we have of the life of Christ, a book that your pastor is preaching through right now, we don't have the book of Mark without the person of Mark. How does he go from being a quitter to one who is entrusted to write roughly 25% of the accounts of the life of Jesus? It happens through the doctrine of encouragement. So you see, this is not just a pat on the back. This is really valuable stuff for the advancement of the gospel. What I am about to say is only in part intended to be humorous. Uh, not that I'm trying to solicit a laugh from you, but it's, if it weren't true, it would really be funny. And that is, I was the worst child that I ever knew. I mean, I was really bad, really bad. My aunt lived to be 98 years old, almost 99, and when you live to be that old, there aren't too many people who come to your funeral, and so I was at her funeral in 2014, and I was standing in the fellowship hall with my little plate of macaroni salad, eating, and, and one of my old Sunday school teachers spotted me, and, and she walked over to me. But she wasn't really walking because she couldn't walk. She was sort of just shuffling. And she walks up to me, and she sticks out her finger, and she said, you were the worst child that ever came to this church. And I thought, okay, but there's going to be, however, it turned out okay because you became a pastor. She walks up to me and says, you were the worst child that ever attended this church. And shuffled away. She's using what few steps she has left on planet Earth to tell me how bad I am half a century after it occurred. When I was in sixth grade, these were the days when the teacher sat up front and the students sat in desks in rows as, as they should and the teacher taught you instead of the te students teaching one another. That's another sermon for another day. But anyway, here's Miss Fischel's desk and here's my desk that sat right beside hers facing the rest of the class. Why? Because I could not be released into general population. I was that bad, and everything I did was bad. I did not obey. I was a wild man. And something happened to me when I was 16 years of age. The grace of God came upon me and saved me radically. And when God saved me when I was 16 years old, all I wanted to do was to be at church to be with the people of God, to sing the hymns of God. I loved Jesus with all of my heart. And the only thing I wanted to do was serve God in the church. That was my passion. That was my burning desire as a 16-year-old just to be with the people of God and serve God. But I had a problem. And here was my problem. I was Eddie Moore. I was the bad kid. Everyone believed that I was just going through a phase, and nobody encouraged me. Nobody except for Jerry Hoover. Jerry Hoover was a hippie. Now, do you know the difference between a hipster and a hippie? He wasn't wearing skinny jeans and drinking pour-over coffee. He was a hippie with, like, genuinely torn jeans, long hair, saved out of the Jesus movement. When he got saved, his wife left him and he was left to raise his two children by himself. 
Back in the 1970s in western Pennsylvania, you did not have anything like a youth pastor, but he was the 1970s equivalent of a youth pastor, and here's what he would do for me. He would pray with me. He would pray for me. He would read scripture with me. He would discuss scripture with me. He would love me. He would teach me. He would rebuke me. And when I would call him, here's the big one, he would pick up the phone. I can remember exactly where I was in my parents' bedroom on Thursday, February 2nd, 1978. I was a junior in high school. I was a wrestler in high school. That was, that was my sport. And that night... I was going to wrestle Frank Baraschetti. Frank Baraschetti was an Italian kid from Brockway. His dad was a, a garbage man. He was, he was a tough kid. And, and, and I was very distraught. I was very nervous. I, I, I was very wound up about this wrestling match. And so I called Jerry and I said, I am very nervous. What do I do? And he said, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 14, verse 27. So I turned in the Bible to John 14, 27, the words that Jesus spoke when he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you, not as the world gives, but my peace I give unto you. Now, I know today that probably Jerry and I would be on different galaxies theologically. And I know that what he did was a hermeneutical nightmare because what Jesus was talking about in the upper room discourse was not a wrestling match that was going to take place at the end of the 20th century. I know that. But here's the other thing I know. That for the last 44 years, every time that I have been nervous or distraught or been at the end of myself, I have gone to John 14, 27 to hear the words of Christ. And even more than that, I have gone to the one who has spoken those words. I have gone to Jesus Christ. I was taught as a young Christian through the doctrine of encouragement to go to Jesus Christ for peace. 44 years ago, that doctrine of encouragement is still bearing fruit in my heart today. And so, as we close tonight, I just want to give you a few practical ways in which you can encourage one another. Really practical ways that you can encourage one another. And my first point of application is this. Pray with one another. Now I did not say pray for one another. Uh, you must pray for one another. You're commanded in scripture to pray for one another. But I, I'm saying praying with someone has an encouraging impact upon them. Several years ago, I had my right hip replaced, and like a fool, on the night before the hip replacement, I went and I watched a YouTube video of a hip replacement. You don't need to do that. You don't need to see that. It's gruesome. And so here I am in my little cubicle in the hospital waiting to go in and literally to have the bone in my leg sawed off. And, and, and I'm remembering John 14, 27, but still, I'm a little bit unnerved. And a man comes in, and I'm glad that they do this. A man came in to verify who I was and what was being done. And he said, what's your name? I said, Edwin Moore. And he said, what are we doing today? He said, you're replacing my right hip. Very good, would you please point to your right hip, point to my right hip. He said, where do you work, sir? I said, I work at North Shore Baptist Church. The man said, you're a pastor? I said, yes. He said, hold on one second. He steps out of the cubicle. He motions for a nurse to come down the hallway. He whispers to her and says, he's a pastor. The woman standing outside my cubicle, like Moses, looks one way and then the other, steps inside the cubicle, closes the curtains, and comes over to me, and she says, pastor, I want to pray for you. And she leans down and puts a hand on my head and a hand on my shoulder, and she pours her heart out to God for me. And as she did, it was as if someone had taken a bucket of warm water and had poured it over my head, and the peace of God that passes all understanding was guarding my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. You see, as a pastor for years, 
I had been going to hospitals and had been praying with people, but I didn't know why I was doing that. That was just part of the job description that they give you in seminary. Someone's sick, you gotta go to the hospital and you gotta pray with them. Well, I can pray with from home. God's omnipresent. No, praying with someone in the presence of that person is very encouraging and it is very valuable. And so when you see a brother or a sister that is going through something, or you know a brother or a sister that's going through something, pull them aside in the hall of the church, or go to their house and pray with them. It is very encouraging. Here's the second one. Gospel reminders. Gospel reminders. I am a pastor I get paid to preach the gospel. And sometimes I'll be coming home from church and I will say to a family member, how was the sermon this morning? And they'll say, you know, Dad, it was, was pretty good. You know, you stayed true to the text, but you forgot the gospel. It's like, ah, oh, how did I do that? If I am being paid to preach the gospel in a context where I'm supposed to be preaching the gospel and sometimes I forget the gospel, how much more will a person who is going through life, who gets blindsided, forget the gospel? Uh, 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 as the great theologian Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. When life punches you in the mouth, the first thing that you're going to forget is the gospel. Here's what an encourager does. The encourager comes alongside you, helps you get your equilibrium, and says, okay, listen up, I know the circumstances are tough, I know that you're weary right now, but let's remember, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, so that whether we live or whether we die, whether we're asleep or awake, we will be with him. Therefore, it is the therefore, the therefore, it is the gospel that drives encouragement. Therefore, in light of that, encourage one another and build one another up. We need to be speaking gospel truths to one another all the time. Here's the third one, very simple. Greet one another. You have no idea when someone is coming from the world into the church what they have been through. And it is the most discouraging thing in the world to enter the house of God and to not be treated as though you are family, to not be loved. Don't wait for people to greet you, but go to them and greet them. It has an encouraging impact. Here's number four. Go and visit one another. We live in a technological age where what you will do is you will send an email or you'll make a post or you'll send a text or if you really are close friends with someone, you'll make a phone call and I have nothing against texts or phone calls or emails or posts. They're, they're all fine. But let's remember the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word did not send a text message. And so we can encourage one another by going to see one another, by visiting one another. Two more. You can be an encourager by meeting practical needs. John the Baptist made it really simple. Let him who has two give to him who has none. You see someone that is hurting, you can practically help them. Let me give you an example of this. It was 1991, I was making $5 an hour. Um, my wife was pregnant with our first son. We were really poor. Uh, I had just finished seminary, was looking for a job, and, and things were really tight. And um, I, at the time, was driving a 1976 Buick Skylark. Uh, it was a car of which my father said, Ed, take, take that car, wash it, and then burn it. Because in its current condition, it's not even worthy to be burned. It was a bomb. And I was at work one day, renting apartments for $5 an hour, and one of the deacons from our church, Eric Slagle, called me and said, I need to borrow your car. And I thought, oh man, how hard up do you have to be to borrow my car? He comes by during his lunch hour, gets the keys, takes my car, and he comes back an hour and 15 minutes later, and I have four new tires on my car. 
I wept. That was 1991, and as long as God gives me my mind, I will remember that and I will be encouraged by that as long as I still can remember. You have no idea how encouraging that was for me as a young person with a baby on the way. If you have extra, share it with those that need it. It is very encouraging. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And finally, everything that I've said up to this point is just a preface to this point because this is my main point. This is the point that I want you to remember. Final point of application if you see something, say something. If you see something, say something. <clears throat> Several years ago, I was preaching at a conference, and there was a young man who stood up, and he preached, and he did a really good job. And I sent him a text, and I said, hey, brother, good job. I, I was really blessed by that. I'm proud of you. Send. Nothing. Completely forgot about it. Six months later, we were at a conference speaking together. He spoke again. Once again, did a really good job because he's a really good preacher. And so as he's finishing up his sermon, I craft a small text and I send it, Brother, I, I, I am so proud of you. You did a terrific job today. Send. Thought nothing of it. He walks up to me after the service and he said, The first time you sent me that text six months ago I read it to my wife and we could not stop weeping and now you have done it again and emotionally I can't take it he said my father is not a Christian I have never had a man tell me a Christian man tell me that he was proud of me and I'm thinking why not why are you so stingy with your words? How difficult would it be for you, Barnabas, to see the grace of God? You might not see it because you might not be looking at it. You might not be looking at it because you might be so consumed with yourself. Or, or, or you might not be looking for it because you might think, well, that person is Rocky Balboa and they're just going to encourage themselves. But no, why don't you look for the grace of God and then when you see the grace of God, have a gladness in your heart because if it were not for God and for his grace, if it weren't for this Trinitarian encouragement of God the Father, the, the God of all endurance and encouragement, and, and God the Holy Spirit, the paraclete who, who has worked in that person's life, and Jesus Christ who has washed that person's sins away, and they are a new creation, and now they are gifted by the Holy Spirit, and they exercise that gift for the edification of the church. We need to be on the lookout for it. We need to see it, and when we see it, our hearts need to be glad and then we need to exhort them. We need to say something. If you see something, say something. If you go to the Waffle House, and I have nothing against the Waffle House. I love, you can look at me and tell I love the Waffle House. But if you go to the Waffle House and you have a water glass, and the waitress walks up and takes your half-empty glass and fills it to the top, you will turn to her and you will say, thank you. How is it that your pastor stands to preach? He has put hours into his sermon. A, a preacher doesn't have to be Spurgeon. It, it doesn't have to be a, a, a homiletical masterpiece. It just has to be faithful. How is it that a pastor preaches a sermon and you are in a conversation with the pastor after the service, and it was like a time warp occurred, like it didn't even happen. You will talk about something altogether different. Is it that difficult to say, thank you for studying this week, thank you for fearlessly standing behind the pulpit and feeding us? In nursery, someone's watching your children. Not tonight, but in... But in general, <laughs> thank you, I'll be here all week. Uh, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, 
generally speaking, someone will watch your children. Is it that difficult when you pick the child up to say, thank you very much. We are so blessed. We got to sit through that whole service uninterrupted. You sacrificed. You kept the nursery so that we could do that. It, you see a mother walking in the church, and she's got a baby under each arm and one hanging on the leg. And maybe she doesn't have any help from her husband. Is it that difficult for you to walk up to her and say, Sister, I, I don't know you, but what I see, I like. And it appears as though the grace of God is at work in your heart. It is a big deal that you are here tonight. And I know it wasn't easy for you to do it. Keep pressing on. Is it that hard for the people that you live with who are serving you? Whether it's dad going out and earning a paycheck or mom cooking a meal or, or parents speaking to your children who are progressing in some way. If the grace of God is at work in someone's heart, is it really that difficult? Is it that expensive that you have to keep your words to yourself? You know what's happening in the church? You have people that are doing the very best that they can to press on for Jesus Christ in this wicked world with their adversary, the devil, and with their flesh warring against them and, and all of the circumstances that are warring against them. And they are pressing on by grace for Jesus Christ and they've got their eyes closed and they're saying, Marco, Marco. And you know what they hear? Nothing. You know what they need to hear? Polo. Polo, come on, you're doing a good job. Uh -uh. A little bit to the left. Now, Polo, Polo, press on. Encourage one another and build one another up. If you see something, say something. Father in heaven, Lord, I sense that this is a very encouraging church. And I thank you for that, Lord. And now, in Jesus' name, for the sake of the gospel and because of the gospel, by your Spirit, I pray, dear God, that these people would abound more and more in encouragement. And this we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.